let's start from the beginning again, Jeff. And a hearty welcome to one and all. This is episode 191 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for spending some of your Monday evening with me here in New York. If you check out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platforms such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, turn on those notifications. So today marks 116 years since easily one of the acting goats and a genuinely, by almost all accounts, a genuinely great human being, James Stewart. Now many know him for It's a Wonderful Life, that that's the movie they think of first when they think of James Stewart. And he lived a long life. He was 89 when he passed. He's been gone 27 years. He died just before 4th of July, 1997. And when I think of James Stewart, It's a Wonderful Life is way down on the list of movies. Because as a film historian, theoretician, if you will, It's a Wonderful Life is important only in the sense that it is a classic Hollywood holiday film. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you ask me which is the better James Stewart movie, It's a Wonderful Life, or Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, it's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. In my estimation, it's not even close. It's a Wonderful Life certainly made a... Like, I don't, I don't know if... This is where I don't know the history. If... It was a huge movie from the start. And I don't mean box office. In this instance, I mean how long before it became a Christmas standard. That I don't know. Because there are movies that are box office hits and then kind of become something else. When Die Hard with Bruce Willis, the original, came out almost 36 years ago now, people didn't immediately, at least I don't remember anybody saying, this is the best Christmas movie ever made. Same thing when we all became fans of the first Lethal Weapon, which came out the year before, Die Hard. I don't remember everyone saying, oh my God, this is the next Christmas classic, only it's an R-rated action film. Sometimes movies take a while to build an audience and to build a reputation for being in a certain niche. And so that's, that's a question if any of you want to answer for me and put in the comments, because this is, there's a little bit of a gap. You know, I, I know a lot about a lot of different things, but it doesn't mean I know everything. And I studied Frank Capra, but I studied Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. I never specifically looked into It's a Wonderful Life other than watching the film along with everybody else, you know, come holiday season. Although it's, I don't think I even have it in my top five Christmas movies, but that's neither here nor there. But James Stewart, Oscar winning actor, all-timer, in every capacity, with that kind of everyman quality, which worked in movies where he could play an everyman and an aw shucks type. But then as he got older and began to take on more challenging roles, kind of inverted the aw shucks, and he started to play characters with a lot more than just everyman qualities. He was a military veteran and decorated, um, it's something that will never happen again. And this is not a criticism. This is just a reality land observation. Um, World War II, there was such a level of desperation over here that people who under normal circumstances would be kept hundreds of miles from front lines, even if they served in World War II, they were thrown, you know, from the fire pan into the fire. And when James Stewart was in the military, right around the same time, I don't think they ever served together, but the baseball, uh, the famous baseball player, Ted Williams, uh, was a fighter pilot. And you know, you start calculating ridiculous stuff like, of all of the celebrities who served, who was the best soldier or who did the best or who ha had um, cross medal for valor, silver star, all of this sort of stuff. Ted Williams was one of the greatest fighter pilots in the history of the United States Air Force. 
And it's it kind of makes sense because in order to hit a baseball, you have to have coordination and reflexes that are at a level that the next 100,000 people don't have. And Ted Williams was an unbelievable fighter pilot. Not coincidentally, he was still in his physical prime and he could fly the hell out of whatever aircraft they put him in just because he was so skilled. Now, I don't know as far as what sort of dexterity, but Jimmy Stewart was not in the military for show. Not that there's anything wrong with that either, because his buddy and his collaborator, Frank Capra, made movies during World War II, propaganda films, as they did over in England with the infamous Listen to Britain by Humphrey Jennings, where he was basically saying, hey, United States, we need your help. Please come over here. Britain's beautiful. Well, Frank Capra was making these propaganda films like Why Do We Fight? And most of the big stars in Hollywood who served, whether or not they saw any heavy action or took heavy fire or were wounded, they felt they were fulfilling their civic duty. And then there was the kind of irony that John Wayne, the alleged war hawk, that big, tough patriot, he didn't want to serve. But you had guys, you had pacifists and, you know, humble good guys who were not pro-war, pro-hawkish at the time, but they felt, hey, we've got to do this. We're enlisting. Some cases, I'm not sure who got drafted, but the idea was that many people who you would never conceive today going off to war. They did it. They went off to war. And James Stewart was one of them among many. And as they say, Henry Fonda, and there were so many others. Now, Audie Murphy was a soldier who then became an actor. He was a decorated soldier. Then he became an actor, the red badge of courage. But when I think of James Stewart as an actor, the first movie that comes to mind is Rear Window. The second movie that comes to mind is Vertigo which as I've discussed on the channel, there are a significant amount of film historians that believe Vertigo is the single greatest film ever made in the history of cinema. That's Alfred Hitchcock's masterpiece. And it is a movie that has so many levels and layers and does so many things, not just well, but spectacularly well, it's very difficult to match. Vertigo is a film that I appreciate historically and I can I can go for hours on this movie. I would say that I studied that movie in more detail than any other film with the exception of maybe Citizen Kane. Yeah. So I can, I can go back and forth on it. I can give you chapter and verse. But if you ask me what's the first movie I think of when I think of James Stewart, I think of Rear Window. Another Hitchcock film, which is, to me, as great, as important historically, as multi-leveled and multi-layered as Vertigo, just in a totally different way. Technically, they're both thrillers, they're both suspense films, and James Stewart is not playing the humble, aw shucks kind of guy. He's playing a guy, maybe not as fucked up as what he does in Vertigo, but he's got some darkness to him. It makes him that much more interesting. I would say my third favorite James Stewart film is Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, the Frank Capra film set, well, it was made in the late 30s, but it was set at that time where he plays an idealistic young man who is basically chewed up and maybe spit out by Washington, D.C., not Washington State. And it's very apropos for today because politics is a tough game, as everyone has said. And this movie is showing 85 years ago. It's fucking brutal. And here's a kid, Jefferson Smith is the name of the character. Obviously, that's a great name. Uh, here's a kid, comes comes to Congress, the halls of Congress, becomes friends and establishes a rapport with all the right people. And he's so earnest and he's cliche city. He's actually trying to do some good in Washington and in politics. He's not in there to try to make a fast buck or to profit off of some sweetheart highway deal where he's going to get kickbacks. He's actually trying to improve the lives of, well, not just his constituents, he's just trying to make things better overall. And so naturally, he gets the shit beat out of him, metaphorically, at every turn. <laughs> Stewart has a speech towards the end of that film, which is up there with his finest film acting. 
And the other, the other movie, though, that I think of is Philadelphia Story. That's the movie in which he won his Oscar. So there's a little trivia. People who know James Stewart, they might know he won an Oscar. But most people, unless they're film buffs like myself, they're not going to immediately say, oh, he won for the Philadelphia Story. That really pisses me off. This is something I'm still aggravated about, even though it happened 33 years before I was born. Philadelphia Story, all-time classic, George Q. Corr. It's a screwball comedy. Cary Grant, Catherine Hepburn, James Stewart. It's a screwball comedy that did something which at the time was nervy and ballsy and daring. And nowadays it would be too, but not for the same reason. So in the world of this film, Catherine Hepburn's character, Tracy, she, her name's, oddly enough, Tracy Lord, and the adult film star Tracy Lords clearly took her, her stage name from that, like this is not an accident. Um, she's marrying a, a young uh, kind of social climber, a guy who has busted his ass, came from nothing, and has made a big success of himself. Her first husband is played magnificently. He should have won the Oscar. Not James Stewart. Sorry. This is Jimmy Stewart's 116th birthday, but facts, you know, all heads must bow, as Mike Tyson once said in the presence of Muhammad Ali. All heads must bow, even me. All heads must bow. Cary Grant acts everyone off the screen in the Philadelphia story. But he plays Tracy Lord, apostrophe S, first husband, the marvelously named C.K. Dexter Haven. And he goes by C.K. Dexter Haven. And there's even a great moment between James Stewart and Cary Grant. They're both really young at the time. Where James Stewart just keeps calling him his full name. C.K. Dexter Haven. I think that I'm very intoxicated, C.K. Dexter Haven. Cary plays Catherine Hepburn's first husband. The guy who was born into money. Ooh, he was born into money. Okay, he was born into money. James Stewart plays a newspaper reporter, and this is where the casting is a little weird, a fast-talking newspaper reporter. Our man Jimmy, fast-talking, him? Reminds me of one of the greatest stories ever told about an Alfred Hitchcock movie. When Alfred Hitchcock was preparing North by Northwest, he had the script from uh, Ernest Lehman. He had Bernard Herrmann, top five, I would say, greatest film composers who ever lived. He worked right up on through Taxi Driver. That was him. Scorsese's Taxi Driver. He didn't know who to cast. He had his choice. Hitchcock was the man. Do I take James Stewart? Do I take Cary Grant? Now, James Stewart with Alfred Hitchcock had already made uh, Rope. He had made uh, Man Who Knew Too Much, Rear Window, and Vertigo. With Cary Grant, he had made Suspicion, Notorious, To Catch a Thief. And Alfred wasn't sure about North by Northwest, so he asked his screenwriter, Ernest Lee, he said, Ernie, I don't know what to do. I got both guys ready to go. I sent out a cable to Cary. And to Jimmy, I don't know what's going to happen. Who do you think I should cast? And according to legend and according to history, and this is apocryphal, but it's probably close to the truth. Lehman said, carry. And Hitchcock said, oh, why? He said, because there's a shit ton of dialogue for Roger Thornhill. If we cast Jimmy Stewart, the movie's going to go on forever. It's going to go on forever because he was a guy who took his time getting his lines across. He was not fast talking, which is why casting him as a fast talking reporter in the Philadelphia story, that was ridiculous even then. But he does his best. He plays a fast talking reporter, Macaulay Connor, who is a, yet another guy circling Catherine Hepburn. So the ex-husband, Cary Grant, C.K. Dexter Haven, still loves her. George, 
her soon-to-be husband loves her. And Macaulay Connor, James Stewart's character, he falls in love with her. So Catherine Hepburn in the catbird seat, as they say, you got two home run hitters and then the guy that she's going to marry. But where the movie takes what was considered an enormous risk at the time, the more we get to know C.K. Dexter Haven, the more we realize this guy, is, he's a great guy. This is a genuinely good person here. So what if he was born loaded? That wasn't his fault. We shouldn't judge him just on that. How does he treat people? Very well. How's his manner? Very good. How's his temperament? Splendid. Well, what about the guy that Catherine Hepburn's marrying? The social climber, the underdog, the Rocky Balboa type character who makes good. Guy's a fucking asshole. Fuck that guy. <laughs> That's basically what the movie is telling us. 86 years ago, or 84 years ago, excuse me, that just because a guy busts his tail to make good, he might still be a sack of shit in human form. And just because another guy, eh, it comes from money. He might be a piece of crap too, but maybe we should get to know him before forming a judgment. Doesn't seem like much, but in the world of that film, they bring it off. And Stewart has moments of vulnerability, and he acts great when he's drunk. Uh, he was not drunk in real life, but he sure sells it. Catherine Hepburn is, as always, incredible. And she had recently worked with Carrie in Bringing Up Baby, another movie where if we're going to re-litigate the Oscars, he should have won for that too. As great a comic performance as me, 50-year-old New York University film school grad, has ever seen Cary Grant bringing up baby. Prove me wrong. I'll go down on that hill. There has never been anybody better than Cary in that movie. And then in the Philadelphia story, playing a completely different kind of guy, very intelligent but refined, not the sort of raggedy, brilliant scientist, but the guy is all over the place. He doesn't even deliver his lines the same way. But Philadelphia story, phenomenal film. It's all over streaming. You got to see it just for the three principles, three of the all-time goats, Jimmy, Carrie, Kate. They're all phenomenal in the film, even if I'm going to sit here and continue to tell you the wrong goat won the Oscar that year. So Stewart worked with Hitchcock in a historically important film called Rope. I've seen it multiple times. It's a good movie. It is not in Hitchcock's top 10. What Hitchcock did, and this is, this is why, I shouldn't say this is why, this is one of many reasons why Alfred Hitchcock is Alfred Hitchcock and why his legacy, he doesn't have to take a backseat to anybody who ever worked in the movie business. Maybe he, he wasn't quite as pioneering as Orson Welles, but Hitchcock was constantly striving for new ways to tell cinematic stories. He never stopped trying to create and stop and, and try to work within the limits of the studio system. Tarantino's talked about this repeatedly. You know, he kind of wishes that Prime Hitchcock had had the opportunity to make movies like himself. So I think he would have done a lot better because Tarantino, there's a number of Hitchcock films that he doesn't really love that other people like, bro, you're nuts. But he, he sees the, the invention and the attempt at trying different methods of storytelling, and he loves that. In Rope, Hitchcock decided, how about if we make a movie that's about an hour and, I don't know, an hour and 35, and we make the audience believe it's in real time? Let's do that. So that's what he did. Shows TV shows like 24. It's in real time. Well, Hitchcock did it first. Now, the limitations of the medium back then, I believe that film... Uh, only about eight to 10 minutes of film could be held at once. So he had to get creative with his editing. But if you don't know what you're looking at, it appears that the entire film is one continuous take. And only Hitchcock would have had the balls to attempt something like that. And he got away, not only got away with it, he made a, a solid film. And James Stewart was at that point in his career where he was starting to play the darker characters. Although in that film, characters pretty much... He's he's good guy. He's not he's not like evil dastardly or 
psychotic, sociopathic narcissist. You know, he's not any of those things. Hitchcock, um, when they made The Man Who Knew Too Much, Hitchcock was convinced until the day he died that his British version of The Man Who Knew Too Much from the 30s, was Peter Laurie in that? That movie I never actually saw. Didn't screen it in film school. The British films that we saw, when I, or at least in the classes I took at NYU, Lady Vanishes, uh, 39 Steps, Foreign Correspondent, we focused more on those. Uh, did not see the original Man Who Knew Too Much at NYU. But Hitchcock believed that his remake with James Stewart and Doris Day was the superior film. And his famous quote, he was a quote machine. The movie I made in England is the work of an amateur. What I did with Jimmy and Doris, that's the work of a professional. I completely dispute that. I don't think that's true. I think that both films are equally great. That's neither here nor there. And Vertigo, Hitchcock got as much out of his lead actor as he possibly could. And in that case, history is thankful that he did not cast Cary Grant in that role. Because even as Cary was getting older, I don't think that, I don't think that history would ever forgive watching Cary Grant play a sociopathic, potentially psychotic narcissist. No thank you. We're all set here. It was difficult enough when they thought he was going to play a murderer in the movie Suspicion, the Hitchcock film from 41. So, yeah, James Stewart in, in Vertigo is probably his best performance because he goes so much against what we expect. And the trick in that movie is that, well, as far as the performance, he starts off the film. He has stretches of the film where he seems like the good old James Stewart we know and love, and then, whoop, turned on its head. But I want to focus on Rear Window. In easel, easily, it might be the best movie ever made about movies without being a movie within a movie. The entire presentation of the film takes place in James Stewart, he plays uh, L.B. Jeffries, or Jeff, if you prefer. It all takes place in Jeff's apartment. Jeff is a very successful action photographer, the sort of guy who could freelance. He could work with National Geographic. He could work with Sports Illustrated. He could work with um, film comedy. He could work for any kind of magazine, but he's the sort of photographer who likes to put himself into the action. And as the movie opens, he's recuperating from a busted leg, which he got on location, working, and capturing a spectacular shot at, I think, a racetrack. He wouldn't move out of the way because he wanted to get the shot. He is committed to the bit. He spends most of the movie with his leg extended at a certain angle. He's got at least another week with the cast on. It's just not quite ready to come off. It's 90 degrees every day. There's no air conditioning. The apartment is burning there's no social media, there's no cell phones, there's no cable TV, there's barely regular TV, you get three shitty channels and reception is poor. Life is difficult for L.B. Jeffries. He has nothing better to do while he's suffering. And his nurse comes in and she busts his chops nonstop. She's correct, but she still busts his chops nonstop. He starts spying on his neighbors across the courtyard in his, you know, the kind of apartment complex. I guess it's probably the Upper West Side, but we're not really sure, and it, it doesn't really matter. He starts watching, passively watching this neighbor, Miss Torso. She's hot. She's a good dancer. We got the newlyweds over here. Wink, wink. We know what they're doing. Ha, ha, ha. We have Miss Lonely Hearts. She's a nice enough looking lady, but she appears to maybe be an alcoholic, and there's a tragic element to her. There's a guy who's composing, and he's watching. The, oh, and here's a traveling salesman with his wife, who I think might be an invalid. And there are a few others. He's sitting and watching and can't exert any effect on the outcome. He can merely sit and watch and get his jollies out of this. Well, when you're in an audience in a movie theater, when you're at home watching on TV, you're the exact same as L.B. Jeffries in this film until the very end. Won't spoil it for those who haven't seen it. This is a top 10, probably greatest film ever made. What James Stewart, though, does here, I believe he's playing older. 
because in real life, as incredible as it seems, because if you watch the movie, to me, he looks grandfatherly, and he's several years younger in this movie than I am now. I guess people just age differently then. I don't know. Or maybe he looks younger than me. I don't know. Who the fuck am I to say this, right? But his character in the film, in a very unlikely, it's not even a turn of plot, it's a main component of the plot. His girlfriend is played by the spectacular Grace Kelly. She unfortunately didn't have very much further to go in the movie business. By 1956, she had met Prince Rainier and retired. But Grace of this era was working very, very diligently, high society, you know, high noon. She was working frequently. And she brings out the best in him in this film. And I feel like sometimes, because Grace Kelly was just so spectacular looking, she doesn't get enough credit for what she could do as an actress. And in this movie, she really does get more out of James Stewart than maybe even Hitchcock expected. So the character of L.B. Jeffries, yes, he's frustrated. He doesn't want to be in this fucking wheelchair, but he doesn't have a choice. And she tries to, and this is pathetic, she essentially is trying to convince him that they are a good match. She's this, not the movie, but she's this high society woman. She's loaded she has lived a different kind of life. She's wearing one designer dress after another in, you know, for stretches of the film. And he's a guy who will be in the jungle with, you know, getting rickets and scurvy. And he's like, yeah, it's just part of the job. He wants her to understand that's the life we're talking about. And she, over the course of the film, wants to show, hey, I am every bit as capable as you are. Just because I haven't done it yet or haven't been given the opportunity it doesn't mean I can't get my hands dirty, that I can't get my feet wet. And so she, not even angrily, but with a bit of smoke and a bit of an edge, she sets out to prove to him, hey, fuck you. I want to marry you. We're right for each other. And one way or another, you're going to realize it. And in the world of the film, he does. And she does. But the performance in particular is he can't do what he does in other movies. Like he made Westerns um, where uh, movies like Call North Side 777, it, where his characters were very active and not reactive. Man Who Shot Liberty Valance with the Duke himself, John Wayne. But in this film, he's stuck in a fucking chair. He can't do anything. And we as the audience, we have experienced that where we're screaming out to characters in other films to do something and they can't hear us because they're not on the fucking screen. They're not here. And he has a moment, this is a mild spoiler, where Grace Kelly is across the courtyard investigating what probably is a murder and she suddenly walks into a hornet's nest of danger and he can't do anything. He is a passive viewer. Even though this is his girlfriend, this is the woman that he probably wants to marry. Oh my God, what have I done? Performance never misses a beat. Even in his interactions with his friend, uh, the detective, the actor's name is, I believe, Wendell Corey. Um, they have a kind of witty banter back and forth, but there are moments where James Stewart levels him with a gaze or a quick line, careful, and vice versa. And it's a very adult and realistic friendship that had spanned decades, but not always without static. And in this movie, there is a lot of static. And the phenomenal actress, Thelma Ritter, who plays the nurse, she's absolute home run hitter. She's incredible. And she's the one who keeps telling James, they marry her. What the hell's wrong with you? But yes, rear window. The story of murder, or maybe not, story of a dog potentially discovering a dead body, or maybe not. Probably James Stewart's finest performance as L.B. Jeffries in that film. He's in every scene. The camera never leaves his apartment. We see other things, but the eye is always there. And he knocked it out of the park. I would say the last really top-level film that James Stewart made is 
uh, Man Who Shot Liberty Valesty, John Ford Western, um, starring him and the Duke. I don't love that movie. Ford made better Westerns. I mean, uh, The Searchers is, is way better. I don't even think it's close. And he continued to work, and in the early 70s, he took part in a remake with Robert Mitchum of Philip Marlowe's The Big Sleep. It was not altogether successful. And, you know, by that point, he continued to work, but I, I just, I saw some of the movies that he did in the 80s. It's just, he didn't register the same anymore. There are some people who are meant to work late, and then there are other people who were meant to walk away. Cary Grant walked away. He was in his early 60s when he stopped. Maybe, maybe almost mid-60s. Was it 1904? Cary was in his 60s when he quit acting. And uh, Sean Connery was, how old was he? He was 70, I think he was 72. Probably would have been better from a historical standpoint if Stewart had retired a little bit earlier, but he was doing what he loved. And he was never less than a great interview and gracious, and he was good with fans. Just an all-around, all-around star in every sense. You know, when I think of great people who worked in the movie business, the first name I think of is Paul Newman, but James Stewart, got to be on that list too, that unofficial subjective list, right? But James Stewart, born 116 years ago today, May 20th, 1908, past July 2nd, 1997. This has been episode 191 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for joining me on this Monday evening here in New York. If you caught this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platforms such as Spotify or iTunes, same rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, turn on those notifications. I'll be back with episode 192 real, real soon. Till then, peace.